looks and says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He basically said, That's the Messiah. That's the one. There he is. And the religious leaders said, We don't want him. They didn't want him when he was a baby. They didn't want him when he came as the Messiah. And later on, several years later from this birth, they would cry out, Crucify him. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Those were his own people. But how fitting that Matthew, primarily written to the Jewish nation, has this account of Gentiles being led by a light to the king of the Jews. You see, an important aspect of that I want us to realize this morning. Jesus Christ is available for worship for everyone. He was not born just king of the Jews. Anyone who sees him and humbles themselves before him and adores him can worship him. It doesn't matter what background you have. It doesn't matter what religion you attend. You can come to Jesus Christ. You can come to Jesus Christ. God had brought light not only to the Jews. Remember the shepherds, the Jewish shepherds? God had a great light in the heavens that was accompanied by the angels and their sayings. Not only did he bring light to the Jews, he brought the message, the light to the Gentiles. He brought the light to me. He brought the light to you. That's why we celebrate Christmas. These Gentiles sought to worship the King of Kings, the Messiah, the Lord. What knowledge did they have concerning who he was, what he would do? We don't know. But we do know this. They recognized that he was God's anointed one, the Messiah, Jehovah himself, and they worshipped him. And might I say that those who are truly wise, who fear God, still seek to worship Christ. Those who are wise still seek to worship Christ. They give him gifts, right? Now, gifts that might seem strange to us, all of us would probably, unwrapping the presents that they give, I don't know if they put them in pretty paper and stuff like that, I doubt it, but just bear with my literary ability here to make things more understandable. Maybe they ripped the bows and ribbons and they ripped every presents. All of us say, if we'd be giving gold to frankincense and myrrh, we'd probably rip the gold one up, grab that one and say, take the frankincense and myrrh, you can have that. But you know, these gifts have some tremendous importance to the Magi, to these Eastern way of thinking, but also I believe there's a deeper spiritual significance to the gifts that maybe the wise men didn't even know. Maybe they didn't even understand. But God has specifically told us the three gifts they brought. By the way, uh, going back to what I said about the myths, we have no idea how many wise men there were either. The Bible doesn't say anywhere that there were three. It doesn't say there weren't three. There could have been. We just know there are three gifts. And I don't think it was three little gifts. I believe they gave him, it says, out of their treasures. They opened up the treasures. And there were those gifts. They came bearing what they could that would honor the king. We don't know how long they were in the house worshiping the Christ child, divine child. But God warns them of Herod's devious plot and they don't go back to Jerusalem. They go back to their Persian lands another way. Meanwhile, Mary and Joseph, I believe at this time, dedicate the baby in the temple. Two elderly individuals, according to Luke chapter 2, two elderly individuals, Anna and Simeon, prophesy over Jesus that he will be the savior of mankind, but the Magi still have not returned to Jerusalem. We don't know how long it had been. I think some time had probably passed, because Herod probably figured it was going to take some time to find this infant in hiding. Sometime figures out, and Herod, sometime passes, Herod figures out, they're not coming back. And he gets so angry. Previous to him being able to enact this horrible decree, God comes to Joseph in a dream and tells him, take your wife, take the child, go down to Egypt, because there are some that are seeking his life. Herod's seeking his life. It says, that night, in the night, Joseph, if I was told by God, and God had already appeared to Joseph in a couple of dreams now, telling him about this child, if I was told by God, someone's going to kill your new adopted son and your wife and you, you need to get out of here and go to Egypt, I probably wouldn't roll over and wait till the next morning either. And he rose up that night and he fled to Egypt. 
This was to protect the baby, but it was also a fulfillment of prophecy. Because God had said in prophecy, out of Egypt he would call his son. And that is so fitting too. There's so many different pictures you can look at here. So different, different types. We don't have time this morning. But if you remember, wasn't it the children of, Israel, Egypt, the children of Israel who were in bondage in Egypt when God delivered them out of that bondage? How fitting that their Messiah would also come out of Egypt. He would come out to save them, to deliver them. So this is a fascinating account. Good drama, action, mystery, intrigue. Too bad we mess it up. <laughs> really tremendous. Yet God is teaching us, and there is a deeper significance that the Holy Spirit reveals, I believe, concerning these who seek to worship the Christ. And that's what I want to finish with this morning, is talking about these worshipers of Christ. The prophetic significance of these wise men and the prophetic significance of the gifts that they brought. The first thing I want us to notice in the worship of Christ. Keep this in mind this Christmas as we worship Christ and after Christmas. But keep this in mind. Those who were actively seeking to worship Christ gave to Him. Those who were seeking to worship Christ gave to Him. We are not able to worship our Lord unless we give to Him as God. Let me explain what I mean by that. To properly worship Him with our mouth, we must give the sacrifice of praise and adoration to Him. Through song, through prayers, through public displays of gratitude. To properly worship Him with our belongings, we must give the first fruits of our increase and from the abundance of our wealth and possessions. To worship Him with our time, we must give the first day of the week to Him and honor and glorify Him. We must give our time and efforts in prayer and reading of His Word. If we are to worship Him, we must live our, live our lives. We are to give our bodies to Him as a living sacrifice. We cannot worship God and not serve one another. We must give ourselves to each other. Worship always manifests itself in some form of giving. That's the way worship manifests itself. It seems to me like the modern church in general is in love with the idea of worship, but has no real concept of what true worship is. There is a popular song. It's got good words in the song. In fact, we've sung it in our youth time. It's called, Here I Am to Worship. And around the country, thousands of people sing that song on Sunday morning, and they really don't even know what they're here to do. They just, I'm here to worship, but... This is what it is, I guess. What is it? True worship is not about style. It's about substance. It's about a substance in what we are giving to God. Worship is not about an emotional response, but about a willing heart. Worship is the process of our hearts, our souls, our minds, being lifted closer to see the glory of God, which will produce both a great joy and delight and a great humbling and quietness before God. That is worship. True worship will always manifest itself in giving, whether it is giving attention to the Word of God when it is preached and taught, giving thanks in prayer, giving praise in song, giving offerings in cheerfulness, giving service to others, giving the gospel in gratitude, giving our time in public assembly and private worship as well. Giving is not usually simply a matter of the emotions, though. Neither is true worship primarily emotional. There might be an emotional side effect to worshiping God, and I believe that we ought to worship God with our emotion. Not devoid our worship of emotion. But that's not the principle. That's not the primary aspect of worship. Many times worshiping God, hearing good music, uh, prayers, will stir our emotions. But that's not all there is to worship. It's not just a stirring of the emotions. It is giving. We must give our emotions and feelings to God. But emotional outpouring is not the essence of worship. The essence of worship is what these wise do. These wise. They see the Christ, they humbly bow before Him, they give to Him. That's the essence of true worship. That's the essence of pure worship. In fact, just the opposite, I believe, is called worship in churches today. It's an error, but worship is thought to be receiving. It's thought to be receiving a spiritual blessing. It's thought to be receiving the presence of God. It's thought to be uh, receiving some kind of entertainment or joy. But that's not what these wise did when they came to see the king, did they? They gave. They presented themselves.